Good evening and welcome to our event, From Quiet to Contentious, where we'll discuss how school board contests that once flew under the radar have become intensely heated, political, and expensive. I'm Erica Meltzer, the Colorado Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat, a nonprofit news organization dedicated to covering the effort to improve education in America, especially for historically underserved students. I'm thrilled to be hosting this conversation in partnership with the Colorado Sun, an award-winning journalist-owned news outlet covering the state of Colorado so that Colorado can better understand itself. My co-moderator tonight is Erica Brenlin, education reporter for the Colorado Sun. Thank you to the presenting sponsor for tonight's event, the Colorado Education Association. Before we get started, a few logistical notes. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the comment section on this video or email questions at coloradosun.com. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Another thing to look for in the chat, you will see a type form link to a short poll. Um, check out that link. Um, go ahead and answer those three short questions for us, and we'll share the results a little later in the evening. This week, Colorado voters will be receiving their ballots in the mail. In many school districts, between a third and a half of registered voters will cast ballots in these critical local elections. That's better than the national average, but far fewer than vote in congressional and presidential elections. In many Colorado communities, these low turnout, off-year elections have been quiet affairs that didn't attract much attention. And when school board elections have been contentious, the divisions more often have been between supporters of education reform and opponents of these policies, generally affiliated with teachers unions. That started to change, though, especially in the aftermath of COVID. Two years ago, Colorado saw a more partisan bent to school board elections, intense conservative swings in some districts, and more outside money from new sources. The outcomes of these contests can have big implications for what students learn and how schools function. With us tonight to discuss these trends, we have Jonathan Collins. He's an assistant professor of political science, public policy, and education at Brown University. He's also the founder and director of the Paved Research Initiative for Urban School Improvement Through Democratic Innovation. We also have Sarah Reckow. She is a professor of political science at Michigan State University and the co-author of Outside Money in School Board Politics, The Nationalization of Education Politics. And last but not least, we have Jubal Yeni. He's the executive director of the Colorado Association of School Boards. CASB provides representation and advocacy for more than 1,000 school board members in 178 Colorado school districts, as well as training and professional development to help those school board members do their jobs. Uh, Jubal is a former in superintendent and educator as well. And with that, I will pass it to, uh, to my co-moderator to get us started. Thanks so much, Erica. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I want to launch our questions with one for all of you, and I'd, I'd like to hear from you first, Jubal. What new fault lines are you noticing in school board elections this year, and how do they differ from what we saw 10 years ago and even two years ago? Yeah, you bet, Erica. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here this evening. And um, and I guess, uh, Erica, great, great introduction and kind of context to the kind of what's happening at this point. Um, a couple different things The um, is that you know, we noticed, you know, one, even over the last uh, couple election cycles, we have an increased number of board members running. Um, and, you know, as we, we talk about that, you know, almost, uh, you know, um, you know, since the 2019 election, you know, probably another 150 more board candidates for election. So, you know, some of the things that we're seeing um, are some of the things that you've been hearing about. But uh, safety continues to be one of the larger um larger issues uh, and it's wrapped up in a lot of different things curriculum which always is more like um, you know these are kind of issues that are always on the minds of voters as well as school boards and in public schools uh, curriculum um, gender and race has always been um, those particular issues um, but i think some of the new things that we're we're getting to you know and you know the covid learning loss um, and I think uh, Eric, you may mentioned that in terms of, you know, just being able to get to that point and, and what's going on with um, our schools and how are we, how are we uh, make sure we get those achievement gaps resolved. Um, and then finally, you know, probably another perennial issue that happens um, all the time in school board elections is declining enrollment. Um, and, you know, these are, you know, these are some of the things that, you know, we're, we're seeing. Um, you know, it's certainly been a little more vocal on a lot of different areas, but uh, those are seem to be the kind of the big themes. Thank you, Jubal. Um, what about you, Jonathan? Can you give us a little national perspective? 
in terms of the, the fault lines that you're noticing in school board elections and how they differ from a decade ago and two years ago? Yeah, first, you know, thank you for having me be a part of the conversation. Uh, it's just an honor to be on such an esteemed panel and, and to uh, be a part of this event put together by in, in partnership with Colorado Sun. Um, so thank you for having me first. And, and second to the question about what we're seeing nationally, and what, what, we're, what we've been seeing is kind of a growing national uh, partisan trend. And so at, at the outset, Erica mentions, and, and accurately so, that the politics of education, you know, a decade ago had, was not about anything remotely or partisan. You know, we were seeing these debates between these very organized special interests, thinking about teachers unions and thinking about or, um, education reformers who were uh, responsible to constituencies that didn't align with partisan cleavages. And now we're seeing these debates happen at school board meetings and uh, developing into school board election contests uh, from people that seem to be very much um, ideologically motivated in a way that we haven't seen before. And so, you know, one of the, if you go back 10, especially 15, 20 years ago, you know, a predictor of whether someone would vote in a school board election or especially which candidate they might select in a school board election, wouldn't be their partisan identity. And now there's suspicion that that's now starting to change, um, that people with very strong um, ideological and partisan attachments are, are finding the school board meeting space and the school board election space as uh, a place to mobilize and enact uh, certain kinds of um, political activity. So you know that's the biggest thing now, is that these partisan cleavages, these ideological cleavages, whether you're a liberal or conservative, uh, Democrat or Republican, that matters in a way that it hadn't mattered uh, before. Yeah, that's so interesting, Jonathan. And we're certainly going to get into that a little bit later. Sarah, I wanted to, to ask you the same question. Are there any new fault lines that you have observed in school board races this year? And, and if so, how do they differ from 10 years ago, two years ago? Hi. So um, I, I probably will be echoing with some of what's been said that I think uh, the new fault lines um, that we're seeing um, align a lot more with partisan or ideological differences um, in a way that was really not very much the case 10 years ago, um, where in fact, if you looked at school board elections, a decade ago or more, you you may have seen contentious politics. That part's not entirely new, but some of those fault lines were actually um, between different factions within the same party. For example, within the Democratic Party, having um, uh, supporters of teachers unions um, supporting particular sets of candidates in opposition to others who were also members of the Democratic Party, but may have been bigger supporters of charter schools or other aspects of what gets defined as like an education reform agenda. And those were sometimes really bitter battles, um, but they were within the, the same party. Yeah. And that's certainly something, for example, that we've seen play out in, in Denver school board elections. Um, I wanted to, to maybe take us back a little bit. Um, how did we come up with this norm of the nonpartisan school board election in the first place? Um, um, I wondered if Jonathan could tell us a little bit about the history here. Yeah, so the, the, the nonpartisan school board election it was birthed out of the progressive era reform movement. This is early uh, 1900s from the 1920s. And we were, you know, the, the country was on, it was deep, deeply seeped in um, cronyism, patronage politics, where it had gotten so bad that, you know, politicians were literally passing out gifts and favors in line as people were uh, going in to cast their ballots. And, you know, who worked in a school system, you know, 100 years ago was more a function of your connection to a political candidate, a successful political candidate, than it was your credential to be a teacher or an administrator. And so we had this reform movement to try to essentially take the politics out of education. And this came with the stripping away of partisan labels uh, in school board races. And this created a larger move to hyper-professionalize the politics of education. So now suddenly we had also the emergence of superintendents who were brought in to be these um, head bureaucrats, uh, education administrators, experienced in the field, knowledgeable about uh, the inner workings and the operations of education. 
um, to spearhead the policy implementation process. And, you know, up until recently, the, the goal was to see how apolitical we could actually make the politics of education. And so it's uh, quite a reversal to look at where we are now compared to where we were trying to move away from 100 years ago. And in talking about school board races this year, we certainly have to acknowledge the incredible amounts of money that we're seeing poured into these elections. Outside spending has really ramped up. And Sarah, I'm wondering, when did we first start to see a lot of money coming into these races? And what issues and and interests were really starting to drive that? So uh, when I worked on on a book about this with uh, two colleagues, Jeff Hennig and Rebecca Jacobson, um, we were noticing um, this phenomenon kind of ramping up in the kind of around the 2010s. So about uh, 10, 15 years ago, more, more media coverage of campaign contributions in school board elections. And it was quite striking um, not only to see the coverage, but also to see the amounts that were being discussed in terms of hundreds of thousands of dollars, or even in, in a few cases, mainly LA, um, millions of dollars, um, way outside of what you would normally see in school board campaigns that usually are not that expensive uh, for candidates to run in. Um, And those elections, which we studied, um, the main issues I mentioned earlier, sort of the cleavages within the Democratic Party, had a lot to do with school choice. So districts where, in particular, charter schools were a very contentious issue, Denver being one example of that. But we were also looking at Los Angeles, New Orleans, Indianapolis. It was not Uh, It was more of an urban school district uh, phenomenon at that time. Um, But we've been seeing outside money in other elections as well, now much more so in the more recent um, rise of this phenomenon. We're seeing it in suburban areas where you have more of a cleavage, um, a partisan cleavage, that you have a mixture of Democrats and Republicans in the district and the potential for closely fought battles um, that have that partisan division to them. Um, And even in the case where you have candidates running for an officially nonpartisan office, it's sometimes sort of known that a particular candidate is being supported by uh, interests uh, or groups or individuals who have a strong partisan agenda um, in, in terms of why they're making those contributions. Yeah, so these groups are are following uh, a sort of playbook that I think we've seen in, in other prior circumstances, where the you know they mobilize around a particular issue agenda, um, they endorse candidates that align with that agenda to make it known, and then the candidate can say, "I'm endorsed by Moms for Liberty" or whatever the group's name may be. Um, they can sometimes offer other kinds of support. Um, related to, I mean, the one thing to keep in mind about school board campaigns, and this, you know, is also something we learned about in our book is a lot, you know, it's not, it's sometimes a first office that someone runs for. They're not necessarily highly professionalized campaigns, but having a little help with how do you get materials printed out? What do you want to put on your website? Things of that nature. But then of course, fundraising, right? Can you get money Um, maybe beyond asking the sort of friends and family and people in your community. Um, And maybe maybe a a large infusion of money allows you to send out a lot more mailers and wage a a much more extensive campaign. So they're they're making that that attention and particular when you have a recognizable organizational name like Moms for Liberty, that's not just known in one particular city or state, but nationally known, they have the capacity to raise money on a larger scale and then have those funds go to candidates in in local communities. Um, And so that's, it's not the first time this has happened, um, but it is, it is a, a, a toolbox that that is available in American campaigns and is, is definitely part of this uh, phenomenon. Thank you. And, um, Jubal, I'm curious, you know, we have 178 school districts in, um, in Colorado. How widespread is it to see um, these more contested races where we maybe have slates, where candidates have to do a lot of fundraising, where we have outside money? Um, 
versus maybe what we would think of as a more traditional style of school board election? Thanks for that question, Erica. Yeah, it's kind of um, it's kind of mixed, and you know, primarily you're taking a look at you know, there's some school districts that are still trying to um, get a full slate of candidates to be able to have elections, um, and but at the same time, you know, you do have a lot of uh, school districts that are having these um, you know contentious elections that are. Um, you know, I can't argue with, with our researchers here. I think they're spot on. Um, and Colorado's not immune to this particular um, national bent in terms of what's going on. Um, so, you know, we're, we're seeing those things. We're, we're seeing those things um, locally, uh, you know, here on the front range. But we're also seeing some of these, you know, even even in some of our rural areas, we're getting, um, uh, you know, school board elections that are, are, are built on, you know, more partisan issues at that point. So this is more of a question for Sarah or Jonathan, whoever wants to take it. Um, we're not seeing these types of contentious races in every community, um, in school districts where the majority of students are students of color. We are not necessarily seeing the same level of parent backlash, even though these are districts where a lot of times, um, students have been very underserved. What are the types of communities where we're seeing these more heated elections and, and what are some of their characteristics? Yeah. Well, I'll jump in first um, really quickly. Um, there's a very interesting analysis that was done by a journalist named Nicole Carr, who uh, writes for ProPublica, that went back and looked at um, all of these uh, contentious um, uh, school board meetings in the areas where they were happening. And I think she looks at well over 50 uh, school districts and every single one was in a suburban district of majority white uh, community members. And you know, it's the most compelling evidence that I've seen thus far that pretty, pretty much underlines um, the, that being the case that you know, where we're seeing the most contentious um, fight, infighting happening, it's in the districts that seem to be less and less racially diverse and more, and more racially homogenous. Um, and the culture war, quote unquote, definitely seems to be having its strongest grip in, in these suburban communities. Um, I, I, yeah, I would echo what Jonathan said, that it was it's very much suburban um, in this case, which is a change from some of what we've seen in the past as the issues have become much more of these culture war issues. Um, and that essentially there needs to be conservatives in the district um, to have the kind of... Um, politics that we're seeing here. Um, and so in more urban districts where there's not many, as many Republicans or conservatives, there's not the same uh, um, uh, kind of battle going on in school board politics on these topics. I want to ask you guys a little bit about kind of the evolution of tension that we've seen throughout school boards and in school districts. So we had a lot of school board elections that were really starting with disagreements around COVID policies, including you know, vaccinations, masking. Then we transition into concerns about critical race theory being taught in schools, about how LGBTQ plus students are served and supported, um, how you know, there can be this sense of, quote, trans panic in school board communities. Why are these dominant issues um, happening in schools and how are they connected with these school board races? Well, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Jonathan, and do you want to start with that question? So where sure, I'll, I'll jump in. I personally locate the beginning of all of this sure. is when is I September, I believe it's September 2nd, 2020. And that's when former President Trump announces uh, the Patriotic Education Commission. Um, and for the first time, um, a sitting president politicizes uh, civic education and, uh, and social studies curriculum. Uh, this was an open onslaught on the 1619 Project uh, that was put together by Nicole Hannah-Jones and um, uh, was getting uh, reached national attention when I believe it was uh, the New York Times that partnered, agreed to partner with Jones uh, to create a curriculum based off of the project. Um, and so Trump creates this Patriotic Education Commission, the 1776 Commission, in direct response. Uh, and the conversation around the language around the construction of this commission uh, was um, 
getting rid of uh, conversations around structural racism uh, and uh, teaching the true history and the true founding of our country and making sure that kids are taught to quote unquote, love this country. Uh, you know, this at first seemed like something that was thrown at the wall to see if it would stick. And it turns out it stuck. And uh, this created the momentum uh, for, I think, a lot of parents to then start deeply questioning uh, what was happening with their education system, combine this with the fact that COVID is happening. And so for the first time, kids are in school while their parents are also at home. The kids are in school at home while their parents are also at home. So the, the distance, uh, the lack of distance between, between them makes it much easier for the parents to now be hyper-involved uh, and, and begin to question, possibly over-question, some of the things that were happening within the schools and the, and the school system. Uh, so, um, you know, there's also another important event that's happening at, at around the same time that triggers the creation of the 1619 Project, which is the death of George Floyd and the surrounding protest movement that erupts in its aftermath. This creates a conversation around anti-racism and anti-racist education. Again, this creates the impetus for spreading um, uh, ed educational curriculum that can respond to what was clearly um, a racist act. And the uh, 1776 Commission comes in as an overcorrection um, to um, the politics of the George Floyd uh, protest. And so these, th these things happening simultaneously, COVID, parents being home with their kids, um, the, a reaction to the George Floyd protest and a reaction to the reaction. Uh, and then again, a part of that reaction being the creation of the 1776 Commission. To me, I think that is what um, you know, created the, the, the jelly bean trail that we find ourselves picking up now. Um, I, one thing I was curious about is how effective, um, how effective money is in swaying election results. Is it, is it always the person who spends more money who wins? Do we see certain types of spending more effective than others? So I can jump in on, on this one. Um, what, what we seem to see is that when a particular group has a lot of money, they um, are able to, to spread it out and maybe not be quite as strategic and focused. And so, for example, um, when uh, charter school proponents had lots of kind of more money than unions to spend in some of the elections that, that we studied in the book in places like uh, Denver and Los Angeles and New Orleans, um, those candidates did have a, um, a higher winning record for a period of time. Um, however, um, teachers unions had sort of a more, uh, a, a better efficiency uh, win rates for the dollars that they did spend. Um, and so I think it's it's hard to say, you know, unequivocally, money always matters, or the candidate with the most money will always win. It's not necessarily like that. Um, there's sort of the issue of the quality of the candidates themselves. Um, are you looking at challenging an incumbent and sort of trying to get a, a challenger um, uh, in an effective enough position to get an incumbent out of office, then you may need to raise and spend more money in order to effectively do that. Um, and then there's also sort of the long game here. That's something we saw with um, uh, sort of education reform uh, proponents um, that there were they might have a record of wins, but that teachers unions tended to play sort of a longer game in local politics. They were the sort of long-term interests in, in their respective communities and would come back every election cycle still supporting candidates um, and sometimes would then eventually sort of regain uh, seats as time went by. And I mean, in some respects, Denver is a, is a big version of that story. Um, so it's, it's yes, like, you know, in, a, in an immediate infusion of cash, you can definitely see money play a role, um, especially in places where there's been very little campaign spending in the past. Um, but, you know, two years or four years later, there's going to be another election. <laughs> um, and so it, it doesn't necessarily win the day for the long term. Um, Erica, I can't hear you at all. 
So, um, so I think we were going to show the poll results at this point. Um, we were, so we were curious to, to kind of understand that what the level of participation of our audience members are in these elections. Do we have those ready to go? Okay, so I am very impressed that 82% of you have attended a school board meeting and that 94% of you have voted in the last school board election. Um, this is a very engaged audience that we have. Um, and this last one is an interesting. Do you trust your school board to make decisions in the best interest of local students? 56% uh, said no. And I think that's actually a, a good setup um, to our next question. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Jubal to kick us off with this. Um, with national organizations have agendas. We have um, folks on the right who are concerned um, about teaching about sex and race and gender and the kinds of books that kids have access to. Um, we have teachers unions that are there to represent their members and are concerned about salaries and working conditions. How well do these agendas map onto the concerns of parents and students and how do school board members navigate these competing demands? Um, and I'll ask Jubal to, to kick us off and then I'd be interested to hear the others weigh in. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I was kind of hearing through that question with all the echoes. Um, you know, we, we had a, um, a presentation here at, at CASB here a couple of weeks ago at our fall conference, um, and Magellan, um, you know, David Flaherty from, from Magellan actually did some surveys and, and he gave us kind of a sneak preview of, of some of the results in terms of this specific question, which was, you know, what are, what are voters concerned about at this point? Um, and, and what type of things are they concerned about for our, our public schools and, um, and this report will come out here uh, probably, I think, uh, mid-November. But um, the priorities that the folks kind of put in, put first and foremost is uh, I'm gonna and I'm gonna keep coming back to this theme, which is the whole issue of funding. Um, so attracting and retaining high-quality teachers was the number one priority that. Um, that the voters have, um, and, and, and right and close to that was increasing teacher pay. Um, but the other thing that um, you know came out of this study was that our voters and in, in, in the communities out there are uh, concerned. Also, the other priority is what students will be doing um, in the future. So, preparing students for the workforce actually was one of the more important um, issues that folks had on their minds. Um, and, and that kind of echoes what's going on in Colorado with all of the you know, uh, career and technical education initiatives that are going on and some, you know, ex excellent programs that are that are happening both, um, you know, in larger school districts, but as well as how, how rural is, is putting those things together. Um, and in fact, I was on a, um, a conversation today with a number of rural schools that were talking about how they're putting those programs together. So, you know, those are uh, those are the primary priorities. So, you know, you ask the question, how do those align with some of these hot button topics? Um, they, they don't. Um, you know, you get some of these things that are, um, you know, as some of the folks talked about, uh, you know, Professor Peterson out of Harvard talked about, you know, these hot button topics, they kind of fly around here all the time. But folks generally focus on those issues that are most important to them in terms of uh, the future of the, of, you know, their future, you know, children and students and those type of things. So that's a piece I can offer at this point. I'll be, I'll be glad to hear some of the other researchers in terms of what they've done. But uh, that's what we're hearing at this point. Um, and Sarah, I wonder... Um, you know, once, you know, once people are elected, how do they kind of navigate these, these issues and the demands of, of actually being a school board member versus these national agendas? Yeah, when we interviewed school board members in some of these uh, cities that had had very contentious uh, elections with a lot of outside money, I think they did find it to be um, kind of limiting and frustrating in some ways that the politics had become more polarized in their community. And if you brought up an issue, again, I, I keep coming back to charter schools, which was, which was more of what we were looking at then, but that they recognized that there was some nuance to these issues that, okay, if you're going to look at whether a particular charter school uh, organization should expand, right? There may be circumstances when you want to say yes to that. And then there may be circumstances when you want to say no, and it's not um, a sort of an all or nothing 
uh, proposition for every board member. They are looking at it more on a case by case basis, more as it relates to specific local conditions and being on a board, you know, that's part of understanding uh, the community. And I mean, I think you can see some parallels to these culture war issues. The question being that some board members might get on the board and that they see it as their opportunity, that they're supposed to follow the agenda that they believe they were elected to enact. And we've seen boards do that in some of these communities where there's been a major shift of electing a slate of candidates that then make significant policy changes in in their district, um, specifically with respect to some of these culture war issues on um, curriculum, on uh, trans students. Um, And um, so I I think, you know, it depends on on the individual, on the board member. Are they they the sort of person who's inclined to, um, you know, see it as I was elected on this agenda and those are the constituents I'm here to represent or do they see their role more as a trustee of the entire district that's going to have diverse interests? No, thank you. Those are some really good points. Um, Jonathan, I know that you both, you work with people who are young students who are fresh out of high school um, and you also um, do a lot of work around sort of more participatory and engaged ways for people to work with their school board members. How do you see um, people navigating the real issues that their schools face um, with all these outside pressures? Well, that's always the, um, uh, the, the paradox is that if you, um, if you open up your phone and you look for the latest news coming out on what's happening at school boards, nine times out of 10, you'll see something related to uh, the culture war, or if not, you know, you'll, you still see maybe remnants of the, the, the old um, uh, contentious politics of school reformers versus uh, versus um, you know uh, unions, but when you dive into um, to schools and you interact with kids in classrooms, um, none of the political debates uh, really matter at that level. And so I think that's the beauty of you know democratic innovation and these more participatory models and elevating the voices of kids and, and, and everyday working parents. Uh, you know, then you start to see the things that Jubal is talking about. You start to see kids who are, you know, they want school to be more fun, more interesting, more, uh, more engaging. They want um, opportunities for um, curriculum changes, but curriculum changes that feed into more hands-on learning opportunities and learning opportunities that will prepare them for the real world and to, you know, find a good job and make a good living. Uh, and you have parents that just want the best for their kids and are looking for ways to find access to all the different things that they, their kids are either interested in in after school programs or ways to help kids who need supports um, that have that face specific barriers, you know, to learning. Uh, a lot of what we see nationally is very much politically constructed. It is uh, organized groups that are very much in close relationships with political organizations that are spreading um, national playbooks and toolkits, as Sarah mentioned. Uh, and, you know, the, the the issue is that I won't say that these aren't grassroots at all, but the national infrastructure is clearly detached from the everyday lived experience of kids. Uh, but, you know, there's an opportunity for, and every school board has this, you know, every school district has this, there's an opportunity to just, you know, tap into the everyday lived experiences of kids and build policy from there. Thank you, Jonathan. I want to turn back to you now, Jubal. So with, with CASB represent. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. That's a great question. I don't know if there's anything I've learned that the rest of you can learn, but I, I can tell you what we do from CASB standpoint. Um, and, you know, and I think it gets back to that trustee word that, that, that we've talked about. Um, that's our focus. And, you know, we don't get into, uh, you know, the, the politicalness of, of all the all the election pieces and those particular things, because, you know, because all the things I think Jonathan said it best. I mean, you know, those those things are there. But, you know, what really matters is what what students are doing. So, you know, from from our standpoint, what we found, though, is that when we focus on effective governance, um, we find that it, it most, I don't know, 
I don't even know if I want to give a percentage. 95, 98% of board members are working from a standpoint of trustee. Um, the question is, how do we how do we make sure we're hearing all those voices? Um, and that'll probably get to a couple other conversations that we're going to have this evening. But it's having the conversation. Um, you know, we we can't we can't just simply say, okay, you know, take our political positions and say we don't want to hear what's going on. Because if we focus those conversations directly on students, then and if we're focusing on the values that we have for the future for our students, then we can have those conversations, and we just aren't throwing, um, you know throwing things back and forth at one another uh, that we seem to get in 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 the election process. Um, I think that was said, you know, one of our one of our authors that, you know, talks about school boards is that, you know, it, sometimes getting elected, those skills to get elected aren't the same skills you need on a school board. And so I think those are the type of things that we continue to talk about. Once you're elected, here's how here's how school boards can be affecting governance. Here how you here's how you can effectively work for students in your community and for your community and how you can engage in your community in terms of how you, um, you know, how you can represent that voice. Um, so I don't know if I have any, I don't have anything magic in that, um, Erica, but um, I think that's from our standpoint is, is a kind of a, a true model from that point. Thank you. That's a, um, I think a good setup for our next question is an audience question that was submitted in advance. And, um, and the question was, um, we talk a good deal about the loss of trust in some of our school boards. What can a school board do to reestablish trust with its community? And I will open that to anyone who wants to tackle it. Well, I'll jump in, but with an answer that's not quite not quite straightforward, because um, school board members now are asked to um, walk a delicate line. And so, well, how do we build trust? Transparency. Um, and being open and discursive, communicative, engaging, and being responsive, delivering on uh, policy promises made either through a campaign or that happen through uh, forums of open discussion. Now, we look at the reality of what conditions school board members are facing. Now, suddenly, school board members who um, say certain things or advocate for certain things Find, them, find themselves placing the district under threat of lawsuit. Uh, school board members are uh, being um, lured into taking stances or making statements that can then be used against them in a political campaign. And so, you know, how do you do the former thing given the latter thing that's happening, right? Like how do you build, engage in transparent, responsive politics when you're when you're um, kind of being lured into a, a mousetrap on a on a on a month to month basis, you know, you know, and that's the hardest thing to do. And so they have to find a way to do to engage in the right politics, but they also have to be hyper aware of the adversarial politics um, that are sitting at the uh, the doorstep every time that they walk into a board meeting room. Thank you. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? Um, and we've also seen um, in the past, many communities have struggled to even recruit candidates. Even this year, we've had school boards that have canceled their um, elections or filled, filled seats with vacancies. Um, is there any good that can come from this heightened attention on, um, on school board races? Um, and Sarah, I'll, I'll start with you because we talked a little bit about this before the panel and, and then would be happy to hear from anyone else. Right. So I think one one thing to keep in mind when we sort of look at the current moment and maybe feel um, dismay about aspects of some of these trends about polarization, for example, or um, maybe not liking uh, lots of spending in elections, is that um, school board elections, especially when they happen in in odd years, as we are right now, um, so off off cycle from presidential and and midterm elections, is that turnout of voters is typically very low um, in most places. Um, they, you know, we're not we're not necessarily talking about an institution that has had sort of the ideal type notion of democracy with high engagement and participation and people really even knowing and following what's going on. And even, I mean, another aspect of that is the media coverage. So 
all the attention, even though it's a lot of it is attention about conflict, um, is actually also leading to more uh, media coverage of, of school boards. Um, uh, and so people know more of what's going on, even though they may not, uh, it may not make them happy. Um, and so I, I guess, you know, just to hold that up and say that it's not, it's not necessarily crystal clear to say, well, we had this really ideal thing going on in the past and, oh, look at it falling apart. It's like, well, it was kind of really low intention, low engagement. People didn't necessarily pay attention. Um, and so, and yes, even still, if you have boards where it's hard to recruit people to run, that's also a sign of, you know, challenges with engagement and, and involvement. Um, though to that point, I would also add that being a school board member at Going Jonathan is, is, is tough. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we, you know, there's a lot of reasons to have some gratitude for people who are willing to step up and serve in these in these roles that have been especially hard um, during COVID and, and in the aftermath. Um, so all that to say that I think if people do pay more attention and even if that attention is in reaction to something that they don't like what is going on, but maybe feel mobilized to try to not let the thing they don't like continue, um, that that could be, uh, over time, potentially a net positive. If there's, if there's a realization that, well, I, I need to be there, um, <laughs> in order to, to have my voice heard a, as well, um, in these, in these, uh, elections and meetings and, and other opportunities to engage. And Jubal, I'm curious if you also, if you see any sort of upside to the, to the moment that we're in here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, you know, and Sarah hit that right on the head in terms of, you know, some of those issues that we get from you know, the participation. But, um, you know, I, I certainly can't ignore the fact, you know, Chalk Beat and Colorado Sun do a great job covering education and we get all that information. And yes, that, that does drive an awareness to what's going on. So, um, yes, I think it is a good thing. Um, I had one of my board members say, you know, we used to be able to, you know, it was that quiet word you said, right? It, we, we used to have quiet, you know, very still governance meetings. And now all of a sudden we are in a forward facing environment all the time. Um, and, and that becomes another skill set. But also, but also what's, um, you, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, I said, after all my years in education and, and working as a superintendent, um, I shared board members care deeply and passionately about doing great work and serving students um, in their communities. And, and it just echoes. And, and when, as you're getting into these you know, passionate conversations and listening to all these things, the more folks that are in this conversation, that is good for education. Uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm emphatically stating that, uh, yes, it is a good thing. We've got a number of candidates running. We've got uh, conversations that we can have. Um, and as long as we can have those um, excellent conversations about those things that uh, matter to students, then we're going to have you know great schools. Thank you. Um, and you know what? Um, I'll, I'll, we'll start with Jonathan and then and then let anyone uh, chime in who wants to you know, these are low turnout elections. Um, I think you you previously gave me a statistic about the national averages and it was in the single digits. Why should people follow school board politics? Why should people get involved and vote in these elections? Well, um, well I guess the, the most important reason that I guess I would start with identifying is how central, you know, schools and education are to our democracy. It's one of the you know, we can think about all the different ways in which we should engage in in politics and, and civic activity. Um, but this is the one area that more squarely helps to reinforce um, a strong democracy, right? You know, since uh, you know, going back to John Dewey and folks who are a part of the common school movement, I mean, th this idea that the key to a strong democracy is an education system that trains our next generation of citizens. You know, this has been kind of a bedrock understanding of, you know, American society. And so, you know, well, where does this 
where does this relationship manifest most in, in modern times? It's a school board election. This is an opportunity to put people in place who will represent the interest of the district in ways that structure um, the policy apparatus to hopefully uh, get us closer to that goal of ensuring that every kid that comes up, um, that comes through our system uh, is prepared to engage in civic affairs in addition to the workforce, but engage in civic affairs. And so when you're voting, you know, you're, you're, you're helping to sort of reinforce really what was the initial, the initial mission, the initial goal um, of both our democracy um, and our education system from the outset. I'm curious how you would answer that question, Sarah. Uh, well, I, I very much agree with Jonathan. I mean, I, I definitely see the, that important connection at play here. Um, and it's, um, it, you know, I, I guess one, one other thing I would add, um, is that's a, you know, a, a tough, a, d- a difficult feature of the way, um, elections and American democracy is functioning right now is that we have seen, it's not only school boards, but we've also seen, um, other local elections, city elections, um, municipal also have low voter turnout, um, relatively speaking. And it wasn't always this way. Um, you can go back uh, 40, 50 years and look at voter turnout trends, um, for example, in in city elections for mayor and the like. And it, it used to be a lot higher, even in these off cycle elections. And you know, it's it's discouraging, but I would just go to Jonathan's point that like these institutions, your schools, your city government are so, so crucial to our daily lives. And yes, we're living in this very polarized political climate where it seems like voting in elections is so much about being for a team for the Democrats or the Republicans, for the blue team or the red team or something like that. And then you have these nonpartisan local elections that don't give you those team labels, so to speak, even though we've been obviously talking about polarization, but but they're so critical um, to issues like schooling, but also policing when you're talking about cities, for example. And I, I to me, again, like to, to what Jonathan was saying, if we want, you know, to see our democracy thrive going forward, we do need to Um, kind of return attention and engagement to these local institutions um, because so much um, occurs at this level and it's sort of like the the growth (laughs) um, for for future elected officials and for people to get involved in a more um, more direct way a more grassroots kind of uh, involvement. And and Jubal is a lifelong educator. What? Why would you hope that people would vote in school board elections? Great question. And Gala, I just want to pile on to what Jonathan and Sarah said. I did. I don't think I could even say it better from that standpoint. But you know, I share that you know school boards is are probably that institution that actually can work through the polarization more effectively than some of our other institutions. Um, and I think it gets to, I think it gets to those things that Jonathan or Sarah were talking about is that we can do that. Um, and I mean, and it happens and it happens in, in, in our boardrooms every month. So yes, um, public schools matter. I've been in education ever since, you know, public schools have been under fire and they've been under fire for a lot of years. Um, but public education continues to answer the bell um, and, and continues to serve the students. Um, and so, no, I, I hope there are, our, our folks can get out and support the candidates and listen to what the candidates have to say. Um, certainly listen to those candidates that are, you know, looking for how we can serve our communities for four years um, and, and collaborate and work, uh, work with their other you know, colleagues that are on the board. Um, as opposed to just saying, well, you know, I really want to just do this agenda. Um, and even when that does happen, uh, folks find that when they get on boards, they they generally step forward and, and start working for the, you know, the, that common good of their community. So it's um, even throughout my career, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Um, and, you know, I, I, like I said, I have a great deal of respect for, for board members and the institution and how things can happen. So, yeah, get out and vote, support and, and do those things you need to do.
Thank you, Jubal. I have a question I want to pose to all of you. I think we should start with you, Jonathan. You know, every point that we're discussing tonight really leads back to the classroom. And I'm wondering what the impact is on teachers and on students when their community is facing such a contentious school board election. That's a that's an excellent question. No, I think there are a number of different ways that you could think about the the impacts that this has. I think you know, but I think I think we should focus on the impact that we're already seeing. And so you know, I got a lot of this is entangled with COVID nineteen, the pandemic, the aftermath. But you know what we've been seeing uh, happening, running parallel to uh, all of the contentious politics is um, massive learning loss where, you know, students have been showing up uh, to school in the fall, you know, months behind where, where they're expected to be uh, based off of um, previous students in previous years. We're seeing a mass exodus of teachers from the, from the teaching workforce, uh, from the teaching workforce, I'm sorry, um, and not a clear enough pipeline of new teachers reemerging to replace those folks who are leaving the profession. Uh, we're seeing an exodus at the administrative level. We're seeing superintendents resign who have been doing incredible work for years, even decades. Uh, we're seeing school board members who have been doing hard, earnest work for very little pay, if any pay at all, who are stepping down from their positions. And so, you know, good people are leaving our schools and really good promising kids are being left behind uh, in our schools. And so, you know, I think you know, what, what's the negative impact of all the contentious politics? You know, at best, it's a distraction from the fact that this is happening. At worst, it's a contributor. Uh, certainly, Garrick. And I think, you know, when, when I was a superintendent, we we talk about, you know, what happened in the boardroom. OK, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over a little micro to the macro here. What happens in the boardroom on a, you know, on a week on a weeknight ripples through the entire school district throughout the rest of the uh, rest of the week. Um, and, and it's the same thing with these elections. You know, we're, we're trying to get to you know, one of the most important parts we have in terms of how we are able to help uh, school boards be more effective is, is make sure that they have that um, good superintendent school board relationship. Um, that permeates throughout the entire um, school district, and so in these elections, when you're you know when you're out there campaigning and you're and you're making these you know accusations and, and you know fears and different things that are happening, um, it, fortunately, a lot of those things don't come to rest when folks get together and, and can work collaboratively. But every time you throw a rock in the water, it ripples. Um, and, and that happens at the elections. It happens every week or, you know, every month uh, during these board meetings. So it matters. So we can do, we're going to do one more question. I really appreciate everyone's time and, um, and maybe start with Sarah. This one also comes from our audience and it's a really meaty question to end on. Um, there are serious disagreements over whether public education should even exist and what public education should do. And we kind of, roll this up into um, sort of polarization and, and politicization, how can we better deliberate on the substance of our differences? I think this person might uh, have spent a lot of time thinking, this audience member might have spent a lot of time thinking about this issue. <laughs> that is a very meaty question. Um, wow. So I, I mean, that's because... I, I, I'll start at one level, which is that we do have uh, schools that have to operate, right? So all these governing structures that we're talking about that might, and, and maybe this gets a little bit at Jonathan's and Jubal's points about like these polarizing debates and then the actual like business of running schools. So right when, when we think about school board members or even state legislators and they're making education policy, right? most kids in the U.S. do go to public schools um, and are going to be showing up in those classrooms tomorrow <laughs> and next week. And, and so um, I, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't want to lose sight of that sort of like basic aspect of what's going on here, even when we're having big discussions about things that might change the way schools operate or people who are proposing um, major 
things like there's been lots of states that have adopted voucher, you know, universal voucher policies um, in in the just the last year that could have um, big implications for um, sort of the status of, of public schooling in those states. Um, but still, at the end of the day, most kids in those states are, are going to public schools. So um, there, I think there's this pragmatic <laughs> tension here over and, and getting to, to sort of, I think some of the themes that Juval has, has brought up is that um, school boards, it, it, like we actually being a school board member does draw you toward that pragmatic type of work, <laughs> um, even if you are inspired to do so by my maybe broader ideological or philosophical um, discussion. So I think, you know, yes, these two things can happen side by side, but you but someone has to keep an eye on the ball of the of the pragmatic work along the way um, for, for the sake of for the sake of the students and the teachers. Jubal or Jonathan, do you want to try and tackle that one? You know, I'd be glad to jump in on that, um, and I didn't get to hear the, the, the last part of Sarah's remarks, but uh, I know they were <laughs> exceptional. But you know, you know, I think you know how do you how do we get to the substance of our differences? Um, and, and obviously, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say anything different. That you know, public education is great. I'm not <laughs> I won't come off of that. Um, but there are evolutions in terms of reforms that we can do. Um, but how do you get to the substance of our differences is engage in the conversation. Um, you know, we've talked about cultural wars and, you know, and I think, you know, Arthur Brooks book, you know, the culture of contempt, um, that has been prevailing throughout the polarization that we've talked about. Um, and he offers just, you know, one, you know, a simple solution, which is engage in the conversation. Don't be afraid of the conflict. Um, and as we are working through that together, we are actually going to, make things better. Um, you know, and I think from, from the standpoint, the evolution of the, what schools have done, um, you know, over the last hundred years for that matter, um, there are things that we, we can do better and get better. And I think uh, we're on that upward spiral. So, um, gauge in the conversation. And Jonathan, have you, in your work, have you found ways that you see more productive conversations? Uh, yeah. I mean, I find evidence that when we focus on the more, uh, mundane or really like top priority issues like, you know, spending and teacher pay and compensation that um, people are more, uh, you know, people are willing to move across a lot of the political divisions. I mean, you know, if, if, we, if we're looking for optimism here, I think there's also this idea that like, we don't really know who these people are who are coming and sh are coming to school board meetings or, um, you know, really leading a lot of the contentious politics. Uh, you know, the irony here is that the biggest suspicion is that these are not parents, um, that a, a lot of the, you know, the parents who are coming out and engaging with school boards, they're interested in this more mundane kind of politics and policy. You know, they're, they don't have the luxury of uh, reducing what happens uh, within a school district's policy agenda uh, to some of the uh, national Media, uh, national media, cultural war things that they're uh, sort of digesting from from talk radio. Um, you know, that's the, the the sort of that's the give and take of school board democracy, which is that it's open to folks beyond parents. You don't have to be uh, a parent of a kid in the district to vote in a school board election. Uh, you can just be a quote unquote stakeholder in that community. And I think the question is, well, what are these outside stakeholders and even some of these parents? Who maybe uh, for some for various reasons don't carry the same kind of um, focus on more of the nitty gritty uh, day to day operations. You know what what are they motivated what are they motivated by? Oh, uh, uh, you know what's what's bringing them to the table, and can we reverse that? You know, can we make the folks who are coming to flip tables over transgender student rights or opposition to it uh, over um, critical race theory? Uh, over book bans, can we convert these people into folks who care that, you know, kids aren't reading, that kids are reading three grades below their expected level, uh, that a kid in, you know, eighth grade is doing math at a third grade level, right? Like, how do we get these folks who claim to be so spirited about the, what's wrong with our public education system 
to see some of the things that are really wrong with our education system and be equally as motivated to address those things.